Wow, okay. You know, it's fun to jump into other pastors' series and all that type of stuff, but, you know, I, I okay, look at up. I gotta stop, look at, okay. I need your guys' help. Who's gonna be my volunteer? You, right there, green shirt, and you, okay? I like to move when I speak. It just, you know, it's almost like, uh, remember the, the B girl that she could learn how to spell words by, like I can speak to my own steps and you guys are like live feeding this so I'm like told I can't leave this box. So okay, you, right there, okay, just give me the eyes. When you see me start gravitating one way or the other. But anyways, okay, back on focus. I, my name is Joe Rigelski, my wife Sammy, we left pastoring a church in Wisconsin to pursue kind of our purpose, our call. It was very, very obvious and evident as we pursued Jesus. The way he invited me into a relationship with him was say, Joe, if you want to know me, you must follow me. So all of our walk for 18, 19 years, while pursuing our own dreams and kind of just doing our own thing, we've always said, God, if there's anything more that you have for us, anything that you desire from this body that you've redeemed, Lord, we submit it and surrender it. And after about 10 years of pastoring, you know, between being the executive director of, of, of a youth center and then speaking for Compassion International and pastoring a church in Wisconsin, um, it just became very obvious that God had a specific call called Upstream. And we got to meet Josh and his wife and, and you guys last October because some people uh, that were in residency moved back here. And, and I just want to tell you guys, before I preach this beautiful message in Romans, um, one, happy Mother's Day, moms. But two, it, have you ever like just pulled off the side of a highway because you were hungry and you needed lunch and you walked into a restaurant where everybody uh, knew each other but they didn't know you? And you, you can feel that feeling where all the eyes look at you and you're like, I don't know if I belong here. This place is the absolute opposite of that. I remember stepping in here, a stranger, completely unknown to you guys. And it's our our predisposed position to be like defensive and isolated and protective. And I remember walking in here and that just speaks to Josh, your leadership, what you've sown into here and the calling that you've had here at Crossview, what it is that you guys care about as far as relationships and welcoming people in. It's huge and it speaks volumes because we do this all over the place. There are times where you walk into a church and you can tell that they're not super excited to have a visitor amongst them, but we're family. And when you walk in through those doors, right? A lot of people have their credentials. How does a church meet my needs? I will tell you the most important part is do you feel Jesus there? And do you feel welcomed? Because outside those doors is a tough world and we all carry a lot of burdens. This is meant to be the safest place in the planet, the house of the Lord. And I feel that way. My wife feels that way. We absolutely love and adore this place. So good job. It's a bravo and a kudos to you. That's just extra credit having nothing to do with today, but really feeling led by that. You know, I, I skipped out of here and uh, I thought it was the coffee at first that got me all like jacked up and excited, but it really is just, it's just that Holy Spirit, right? You, you feel the spirit, man. It's all the no dose you need. You know, you don't need a triple shot. You know, you just press into God and he'll give you everything that you need. And I felt it, man. You just, people sincere, you know, wanting to know the Lord, wanting to know more, getting into the word, going into jail ministry, going to your community, partnering. I mean, this... I say little, not as a negative thing, but a smaller church that's doing more in its community and more inside of the world than, than, than some of the biggest churches I've gone to that are very, very self-centered. Enough about that. So anyways, my wife is with me on Mother's Day, which is a big deal. She left eight children behind. Eight children behind. Thankfully, all of her other husbands and boyfriends are taking care of those kids. But... <laughs> <laughs> Not funny. We, I say that because we, we, you know, when you walk out of places with eight children, you get looks. And one time we're walking out of Festival Foods and she was like a step ahead of me and I'm right behind and a firefighter, they were doing like a fundraiser, looks at her and goes, those are all yours? And she's like, yeah, with him? And she's like, what are you trying to say here? You know, so it's like, you know, we talk about uh, the newness that comes in Christ. Well, well, some of it is, you know, you can actually be married for 19 years happily and excited and have eight kids with the same woman. Isn't that radical? That's radical. 2018, that's unheard of, but that's the power of God. That's good. So happy Mother's Day, babe. Back on point as I drift far, far away from the shores. 
Romans is notoriously, as far as pastors are concerned, as far as theologians, commentarians, all those type of people, Romans is described oftentimes as a, a difficult book. It's a challenging book. And as I shared with the first service, um, I don't receive it that way, and I don't say that arrogantly, but I think it's a challenge for those that have not experienced being truly born again. Because what is rich and deep and profound about Romans is actually quite simple, but extremely difficult to teach because conversion and being born again is very experiential, right? I, I shared with first service, I could sit here having spent thousands of hours and hundreds of days in Haiti, learning the culture, learning the people, walking the streets, getting to know the rich and the poor. And I could sit here and paint a beautiful picture of what Haiti is like to the point where maybe you could create your own illustration, your own picture of what going to Haiti would be like. But it would not even come close to the moment that you land there and you experience a few hours, a few weeks. In those moments, you will already know about Haiti far more than if we had a hundred classroom teachings about it. And this is what's challenging about Romans. Because you have Paul. Paul, one of the guys that I connect to the most in all of scriptures, who experienced what it truly means to be born again. To cross over from an old life into a new life. And now he has the challenge of trying to share with others what this new life is all about. All the parts that come with it. The renewing of the mind. The death of the law. And, and becoming slaves to righteousness. All the things that we're going to study today. He's trying to teach them, trying to teach them something that has to be experienced. My first two years of, of, of knowing the Lord, I had the privilege and the burden of working in a factory. Working in a factory for a little while, you, you learn that you never want to work in a factory again. Bravo to you guys that can do that. I, I couldn't do it. But my job literally took me 40 minutes to load this big massive part, a little bit bigger than this, this horse trough here, into a machine punch in a couple of codes, and then watch it spin for the next eight hours, just making sure it didn't break. But I had a fresh new love of the Lord, and I would read scriptures, read, I mean, I would read and read and read and read. Much like I was saying earlier, though, it wasn't until I would experience those scriptures that I would have the true revelation of the meaning of them. And this is what the word of God is meant to do. We are to know it, have it be in us, but then also to be able to experiment and experience it. This is when revelation happens. Meaning this, I can read on a page that there is power in the words of God. I can read that. Then there needs to come a moment where I see a crisis, I see somebody that needs to hear those words, and I speak them, and I watch them give life. We used to do work with our youth groups sometimes. They hated it. I'd say, I want everybody to close your eyes. And I want you to just pray and say, God, give me a word. Give me something for anybody in the room. Whatever. The whole practice, right? I wanted them to practice and experiment and experience the things of God. And there was one boy. Just, I wouldn't say hard of heart. He loved the Lord ferociously, but he thought these types of practices were silly and foolish. So we come out of this moment, and everybody kind of does their thing. And it's profound, right? Like somebody's like, oh, you just spoke completely to my heart. I need to hear that. You know, there was life in these people's words. Well, this guy goes, I don't know. I guess I'm just going to say it. Paula, which is the girl that God kind of had him. And he said one word. And that girl just fell and weeped and bawled. And Max sat back and he's like, what, what just happened? What just happened? And she started sharing like, I have been praying that word for a month. She was going through a struggle and a hard time. And all of a sudden, like she felt like God had just responded to her through her friend. This is what I mean by having the word of God in us and being ready at a moment's notice to give it, experimenting with it, to see that it has power. Okay? So the challenge with Romans is this. I'm going to teach it. Just as Paul has given us the words to teach it and share it with you. But it doesn't have really any power until it's put into practice and experienced. So here we have Romans 6. I'm going to pray real quick before we jump into this because my words are of 
foolishness if they are not sown with the power of the Holy Spirit and of God. And although these are Paul's writings, they are still inspired and given to him by God. So, Father, so you guys are going through books. I'm very familiar with going through books. I enjoy going through books. I think it's one of the best ways to preach and teach. So oftentimes we can just pick topics and kind of hammer sweet spots, and we just miss the fact that we are to know all of the Scripture. Whether we know it's beneficial or not, it is. And that's the importance of Scripture is it's timeless. It is intended for all people of all nations for all times. So although this is a message that Paul was preaching 2,000 years ago, in the context of the history that's happening, it is just as relevant and just as applicable to our lives now as it is then. Our job is to dig it out and unearth it and find out what it is that he's saying to us today. So inside of Romans, as a book, as a whole, it's really pushed through two main filters. One is the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. The perfect, holy, transcendent, amazingness of God. It's this, as I was saying before, taking this finite being that desires knowledge. And we are smart, but it's succumbing to the understanding that if there is one to carry the title God, the very name itself means that he is supreme. His ways are not my ways, and my ways are infinitely lower than his. So although we may come to understanding and we may think more highly of ourselves than we ought, we still defer to a God in understanding that he is perfect, holy, and righteous. Romans is pushing all of its teachings through the understanding that he's righteous. The other main theme is this new life. It's the death of old things and the start of something new. And here we are in Romans 6, and although it's kind of a singular point, at least from my perspective, there really is inside of six just these four verses that I think gives the whole theme of what Paul was saying through Romans 6. So instead of reading an entire chapter, if you're with me, we're just going to read Romans 6, 14 through 18. And we're going to dig this thing apart and see if we can't come away with something that applies to our life, that we can walk out of here changed, renewed, a little more passionate than when we walked in. Romans 6, 14 through 18 says this, for sin shall no longer be your master. It literally means that sin should no longer have dominion over you. Sin, in your old state before coming to Christ, truly was your master. It had dominion over you. He says, because you are no longer under the law, but under grace. This is an introduction of something new. We have to understand, you and I have been hearing about grace for 2,000 years as a Christian church. That is what the Christian church is founded on, is this all of a sudden newfound grace. Prior to that, obedience to God was found through the law. So he's saying, you are no longer under the law, but under grace. And the question is asked, well, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Paul says, by no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as slaves, that you are slaves to the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, what he's saying here is sin, no matter how tempting, no matter how good it tastes for a season, it still leads to something negative, whether it's conviction or condemnation or, or true, literal death. Sin, although tempting and always enticing, it is never everlasting. He's saying that although you were slaves to sin, which leads to death, or now to be obedient or under obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Almost like a riddle. I think one of the challenges with Romans oftentimes is because of the wording and us sometimes in the English language not having singular words that may have depths and layers to meaning, the challenge of Romans is saying, okay, what is Paul really saying? What is the cultural and the historical context that helps me understand what it is that Paul is saying? I couldn't think of any better way than first to just say, the entire reason why Paul wrote the book of Romans was to give believers a concrete theological foundation on which to build this new life. 
The one thing that we have to understand is there is a new life that's happening. This is no different than anybody that's been working a job for a long time. Some of you guys maybe have been in the same job for 20, 30 years, and the boss coming in and saying, everything you've done for 20 years is now going to change. The programs, the systems, everything, everything's gonna change. There is a learning curve that's gonna come. You may be familiar with the vision and the idea of the job, but now everything is gonna become new. It's a very bad analogy, but it's something maybe we can wrap our head around. Jesus came in and flipped the entire script. He says, whatever you've been doing for a long time is all changing now. It changes with this word called grace. Up until this point, Paul, being very acquainted with his audience, having once been a member right inside of the Jewish faith and being part of the elite and a student and even a Pharisee, knowing all of the law, he too had to understand that this was gone. Everything he'd ever known Every cultural truth, everything his grandpa told him, everything his dad told him is now changed. And it's different. And the audience is receiving this in a way of not really understanding because although they had a heart towards God, so much of their obedience to the law that they were under was mostly motivated out of fear. Mostly motivated out of fear. And this is what God wanted to change. God did not want people walking around obeying his laws and his rules strictly out of fear. What does this mean for you and I? What's a great way to understand this? Today, we all drove here. As we drove here, we obeyed many laws. Many laws. Stop signs, stop lights, yield signs, pedestrian lines, chain, you know, all of these different things. Well, I don't know about you, but if I'm gonna be very honest, I obey most of those laws out of fear. Most of the time, out of fear. Fear because there are guys out there called law enforcers. You know, you know it's fear because when they pull you over, your heart's racing, and they tap on your window, and you're, I don't know, if I'm, I'm, I'm a fight guy, not a flight guy, so I'm completely in the wrong. I know I've broken the law. This guy's just coming to let me know that I have, but I want to fight. Like, you know, it's just... Our spirit is just against the law. Like it just, there's some innate part of us that is just against it. It's sin, really. But anyways, my whole point is this. If we are walking through our day, driving, obeying all these laws, and our only motive to do so is because of fear, we've missed the entire point. Because here is the reality. This city, we use the city because you live in it, had a bunch of people that actually cared about the city, loved the city, and had to put their hat on to say, what would be the safest practice of, of travel for our city? What intersections would it be appropriate to have a two-way stop or a four-way stop? How are we gonna prevent accidents? How are we gonna keep children crossing streets to schools from getting run over? How are we gonna do this? And them having the authority push through that motive we're able to put those signs there. The idea is this. Paul's people are saying, you remove those signs from our towns, are people just allowed to drive as fast as they want? Are they allowed to just, you know, drive through school crossings and run over children? Paul's saying, no. No, see, you used to obey the laws out of fear. But with this new life, you are no longer a slave to fear. You're a slave to righteousness. In your new life, you are now tethered to the lawmaker. And you actually understand his motive and the reason why he put that sign there. And it was not to inconvenience you, right? As I sit at a stoplight and be like, whoever set this thing to 45 seconds could easily turn this to 30 seconds and my whole life would be completely changed if I could just get through the stoplight faster. Who put six red lights in a row? Like, can't they have, you know, like, we question the maker of these laws and we completely miss what their motive was. God's motive was simple. It was pushed through love. What can I do that is best for my child and just like a child that wants to be singled out amongst a family of many and be special, he also says, what can I do that's best for all of my children? 
And he created the laws that way. But the problem is, thousands of years of following those laws, we had a group of people that missed the whole point. They'd forgotten. And they just were being obedient because they were slaves to sin, slaves to fear. And Paul, as in the entire book of Romans, is saying, no, our God is righteous. It's not like the laws, as far as the motive and intent went away, he was just saying the way you follow them now is different. You now follow them because in being a new person, you are imparted with the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. As we read through the Gospels, do we truly understand that all of the awesomeness, right? It's like, I just watched uh, Infinity Wars, and you, and you watch all these guys with superpowers, and you're like, these things are awesome. You read the Gospels that way, right? Like, these are, this is awesome. Like, these are... The thing is, guys, we, we, unhindered to our flesh, meaning not controlled by fear, not controlled by embarrassment, not worried about things of this world, that Holy Spirit would allow us to participate in those same things we read about in the Gospels. It is our coveted promise. Not only are we co-heirs to the things that come after this life, God asks us to be co-heirs in his ministry here, his suffering here. All of what made Christ who Christ is, aside from perfection, is available to you and I. That's hard for us to receive. If the enemy has done anything great, particularly in America, although we seem to be the most confident people, we also are the most insecure people. I've never figured that out. We, we seem to be very confident. But when you press in, we're actually very insecure. Almost as if we're, we still feel unworthy to receive all that it is that God has given us. Still, with a bit of a shadow of sin that lingers over us, it says, no, no, I, 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 could, I could never share the word of God with someone I'm not worthy. I could, I could never really believe in healing, although God says it's available. I mean, anyways, I go on a tangent. But what I'm saying here is, is Paul is trying to do something very simple that is very complicated apart from experience. I kid you not, after first service, I walked out there and somebody grabbed their phone and said, right after the service, my daughter left and she said, all of Columbine, Columbia, 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 Columbia Drive, stoplights are off. You guys experienced it? And I said, was everybody like just running over people? Like, were they just going like, woohoo, stop, lights are off. I'm going to go 100. No. You were? Okay. He's not really saved yet. Because you're not about, you, listen, the law is dead. You know, you can do whatever you want. You can waver on the grace side if you want. But my point is, is this. Although, which, was that too far? You know I was joking. God bless you. Sometimes the things that come out of my mouth. Like I, I swear, I've worked on filters. Okay, so my point in all of that was to really lay an illustration that I couldn't even have given an illustration like this first service because that literally happened after, after we gave this service, all wrapped around traffic. The lights go off. This, was, this is what the people were challenged with. They're like, all we've ever known is obedience to the law. And all of a sudden the stoplights are going to be gone. Does that mean we can now just fly? No, because what he's saying is tethered to God and being a slave to righteousness, which is what we're going to get to here in grace, is, is that you now are going to comprehend what is safest practices for you and for others. Right? You, you wouldn't just, although you can in an open field, hop on a horse and ride as fast and as wild as you want, you wouldn't do the same on a parade route 
right? You all of a sudden now have an understanding that goes beyond yourself that says, no, the law is removed, but to keep myself safe, my fellow brothers and sisters safe, I will just do what is right because it's the right thing to do, not because I'm afraid that a cop's going to pull me over or that I'm going to have to stand before a religious you know, council and be shamed or scolded as these guys were back in the day. They obeyed the laws because they, didn't, they feared repercussions just as we do. We're attaching a lot of this to physical things, but it's as much spiritual. Meaning this idea of doing what's right unto others because it's the right thing to do. All of a sudden being tethered to God in righteousness is something that is very foreign to us. I remember the greatest revelation that I went through in experiencing being born again was all of a sudden the day that I didn't just think about myself. Not only was that very common, it's celebrated, at least when you're not saved. I didn't grow up in the church, didn't darken the doors of church, didn't have Christian influence around me. It was very benign to me. I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. I was very much of the world, from the world, birthed into the world, cheered to like, you know, like, like just go after, get everything you can. You know, it's, it's all about you. And I remember all of a sudden like waking up one day, having done the same thing I've done for years and years and years, and turning on the TV and watching BET or MTV or whatever, having never, never, ever experienced a conviction and instantly having a conviction. Like, that girl shouldn't be wearing that. That's somebody's daughter. Like, she's, she's going to be married someday. What's her husband going to think looking back, seeing her throwing money around a pool, dancing on Biggie? You know, like... <laughs> but that was weird, right? Like that's a strange experience. When yesterday you could have cared less. Like, because that's beautiful. Like I, you, only, you only filtered it through me. Well, that's cool. I like to watch it. That, someday I want to be Biggie on the pool with girl dancing on me, throwing money around. Weird, I know. But, but also very common to an unsaved person that's not tethered to the righteousness of God. Conviction. Conviction is from the Holy Spirit. Condemnation is not. Condemnation is from Satan. We should curse it, yell it, and say, get away from me. When all of a sudden, something that we st- you know, trip or stumble or fall upon, that the enemy grabs a hold of to make us feel guilty or unworthy of God's grace. But now conviction is the way the Holy Spirit encourages us to lay things before him, to work them out. So, experiencing a new life is much different than learning or the knowledge of a new life. So I always encourage, 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 encourage people. The biggest hurdle for all of us to overcome, another very American thing, is just being embarrassed for the gospel. You know, I get to be a part of churches in Kenya where after we share the gospel and we watch people say yes, yeah, there's celebration, but there's weeping because we know what that's going to cost them in that moment. They're going to go back to a village where they're going to be disowned. They're going to be told to pack their things and to never come back. And they've weighed the cost. They've weighed the cost. They will do that to follow Jesus. In America... We will never face that. But the same demand is on our lives. And that's the willingness to surrender this body so that God can have access to it. Every day you walk past someone that prayed, God, where are you? Jesus, I need you. God, make a way. And as much as God would love to descend from the heavens and grab that person that just prayed and comfort them and walk them through their trials, he doesn't. What he does is he looks for a willing heart a surrendered heart that that same morning said, God, you redeemed me. I am yours. Use me today however you see fit. And somehow, some way, with a little magic dust, God crosses our paths. And in that moment, he hopes that you won't be so embarrassed that you're willing to share a message, a word, a smile, and I love you, or whatever. This is the beauty of what God has allowed us to partake in. I shared with a guy out in the hallway, I would never serve this God, this God that we call 
our Father if it weren't for that portion of what he's entrusted to us. Because in my mind, a good, benevolent, loving God that has tasted the horrible parts of this world, death and disease and cancer and car accidents and entire families you know, killed or murdered or persecuted, all those things God is very aware of. Why then, the second you said yes to Jesus, would he not just snap you up? Keep his loving children away from the pains of this world. If it weren't for this part, if he didn't say no, God, I, as he said to the upper room, I, Jesus, can only do so much. It is by placing my body into the soil where he gives the grain of wheat analogy. Through my death, it will give birth to more. He says to us, we will do even greater things than he. It doesn't mean we'll walk on water better than him. It doesn't mean we'll bring someone from death to life more alive than him. What he means by greater things is we will be able to do more because there's more of us. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is now living and dwelling inside those that call him Lord and Savior. There are now millions and millions of Jesuses in the world. Unhindered to our own fears, our own worries, our own insecurities, the Holy Spirit will only continue the work of Jesus Christ. It is why we carry the name Christian. It's a powerful name. I don't know about you, but every town has powerful names, right? In my town, if you're of this name or of that name, you're like, oh, you're from that. You are a Christian. No greater name. No greater name known in all of history than to be attached to the creator of all things. This is our legacy. Somehow I'm preaching a whole different message than first service. First first. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. Hi. So, <laughs> Paul's audience has always and only known obedience through the law. And now we have this introduction of a word called grace, which is what we are under, which has some of its own problems because it very easily can be received as like a free pass. This was their concern. Does this mean now that we are under grace that we can just continue on sinning? Because they understood grace as meaning just pure and total and utter forgiveness for whatever we do. That was not the point. The point was now not that we had a free pass to drive as fast as we wanted or to not stop where we knew was the right place to stop. He was just saying, grace means... Jesus descended from the heavens for the sole purpose of justifying you. Meaning he could walk here and report back to God the difficulties of this life. He was no stranger to temptation. No stranger to the power of the enemy, which they put in power. The prince of the air, who is a ruler for a season. Jesus became acquainted on how easily he could ensnare and trap us. Grace became a covering for us to know that when those moments happen, when, when our motive and intent is to obey the law because we know it is right and good and sown by one who has authority and righteousness to establish it, that when we do trip, stumble, or fall, grace is there to keep us from feeling condemnation or unworthiness. You understand the difference? You take the word grace in a me-centric, self-centered culture, and it can have a lot of dangers. You know? In immaturity, a young man may say, oh, I know I shouldn't do this. But I'm going to trust in God's grace, do it anyways, and hope tomorrow that God's forgiveness is there for me. Oh, if God knows all things and he knows the intent and the motive of the heart, oh, how would you treat your own child? You tell your child not to dig in your purse and take five bucks. They really want a slice of pizza and a chocolate milk for lunch. You've told them a million times, don't go in mom's purse, don't take my money. But you catch them. And they say to you, yeah, I, I knew that it was wrong. I knew I shouldn't. Yes, you told me I shouldn't. 
but I really wanted it and I did it anyways. That's coming from an earthly mom or an earthly dad, the type of righteous anger or frustration we might have in that moment. Will we forgive them? Yes. But does that mean tomorrow you catch them doing the exact same thing and their motive was because they felt like you were obligated to forgive them? No, there's, there's a difference. We have sold grace a little different than its intent in Scripture. And we know this because Jesus talks many times about those that worship in God's name, those that save people in God's name, those that attend church in God's name, yet he still has the ability to say, depart from me, you evildoers, for I never knew you. And he finishes it by saying, for you did not do the will of the Father. This is that tethering that comes with the new life. This is the difference between obeying God because of fear of punishment, of breaking a law, or becoming a slave to righteousness. Paul says here, inside of the scripture we read, listen, you gotta listen to this, okay? Thanks be to God that you used to be slaves to sin. Slaves to fear. You, you, you were a slave to it, I meaning you were drawn to it, and the only thing that prevented you from not doing it was fear. You had missed the motive. And we know this because then he says, you have now come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. I Meaning the law was established there to make it clear what the rules were. The motive got lost over thousands of years. That it was originally created by a perfect righteous God intended not just for your benefit but for the benefit of others. That now it could be washed away because now you obey it because of your heart's understanding. You now, through the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus walked, are tethered to God. And this is where he blows all of our minds. You talk to an unsaved person, someone that hasn't met Jesus or whatever, they oftentimes feel like they're free. Well, the word of God says this, a foolish man thinks he is free, for he is either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. And here he says, being a slave to sin only leads to death. Think about all of the things that have enticed you. The things that you knew weren't right, but you knew they would bring some joy. I don't know how to give examples. I have some of my own vices. But they're those things that you talk yourself into and you do them. And there might be some experience of joy, but it's instantly followed with regret, shame, why did I do that? And death. The ultimate cost of sin is death. And Paul is saying now through this new life, you become a slave to righteousness. And righteousness fruit is everlasting eternal life that only produces good things. It comes at a great cost because it means forsaking the things of the world forsaking and fighting against those temptations that bring those momentary just, but then falling into the arms of something that produces true life. If there is no option of freedom, and I either have to be a slave to sin, which only produces regret, hurt, shame, and death, or to be a slave to righteousness, which produces good things, peace, patience, happiness, joy, self-control, and most of all, love, which would you rather choose? Which would you rather choose? It says in 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In this new life, you are handed a passport book, making you a citizen of heaven while living as though an alien in this world, not in this world, but of it, not of this world, but in it, you have full access to all of your citizenships of heaven here. Just as when I'm an American traveling abroad, if I get in trouble, if I can find an embassy, I can have all of my American rights 
protected and looked after for me in my times of trouble. We all carry a passport far superior. In moments of trouble, in moments of hardship, in moments of wonder, we are to be reminded that we are only here for a short time. And that while we are here as born again believers, we are actually citizens of heaven who have access to things to give life, to overcome sin, to be free under grace and not live under the condemnation of tripping and stumbling or falling. But most importantly, while we are here to be sharers of that good news with others. Upstream International, which is what my wife and I are representing here today, lives, the entire mission is all about purpose. We all were created for a purpose. Every single one of you sitting in these pews has a purpose. It may be different. And I don't know why it is that we put so much emphasis on somebody that has a call of being a pastor or a missionary or whatever, because it's just one of many. And no real works of God happen without the body functioning as a whole. Great. My wife and I get to go travel the world and looked at through an immature heart, it probably seems super romantic and, oh, I could never, it's hard. It's lonely. You see and are exposed to things that go beyond the romance of it. But it's our call. It's our purpose. And we're honored to do it. Pastor Josh, it's hard to be a pastor. Hard. Because a true pastor cares about people, wants to shepherd people. If he has any faults, it's that the guy loves and cares too much. And realizes, just like in any relationship, he can't make someone love him more. He can only do his part. And this guy does his part. Never met a guy that loves people more, that's more willing to give. But guess what? He can't carry the full weight to the mission of this church. He can't attend to all the children, attend to the coffee bar, attend to the jail ministry, attend to this, attend to all of you, preach, make sure that these guys are all being fed. He can't do all of that without all of us doing our part. The gift of helps, the gift of mercy, all of those things are just in equal standing. I get a hangnail from time to time and it ruins my whole day. One little part of the body that's off or is, is affected, the whole body suffers. And today we have opportunities to partner with God, whether it be through our local church, whether through coming out and going on a trip with Upstream, supporting and sponsoring a kid, helping missionaries go along. As long as you're doing something other than just consuming, consuming for yourself all of what God has. It's very easy, very easy in a me-centric, self-centered culture to all of a sudden have a God and promises and just say, hey, this is, this is all for me. It's all for me. Bought, redeemed, purchased, adopted are all words associated to what come along with our salvation and our inheritance in heaven. And as much as God loves me and as much as God loves you, he also does it for a purpose. And that is that you will be tethered to him, a slave to righteousness, allowing the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit does. And that is to continue the work of Christ seeking and saving the least, the last, and the lost, taking care of the poor, healing the sick. This is what the body of Christ is all about. And where will we be and what will we be doing when Jesus comes back? Will we be partakers in that? Spreading the gospel, baptizing people, ministering with one another. I don't want Jesus to come back and me being a lackadaisical, lukewarm state with a checklist of what the church and what God isn't doing for me. I wanna do my part and be active. I wanna see other people be active because many hands truly make light work and God cares. And if you are a slave to righteousness and tethered to him, you should always feel that stirring inside of you. You might resist it for a season, you might be fighting it for a season, but God should be saying to you every day, the reason why you're discontent is because I need you. I wanna use you. 
You're in a workplace and there's a guy that works right next to you that needs to hear the message. He needs to be loved by me today and I can only use your hands and feet. Will you surrender them to me today? Or your pocketbooks, maybe you're busy and God has blessed you with the ability to make money and he's just saying, sow some of that alongside of the kingdom. There are other people willing to go out and be in the trenches. We know that your job is at home and, and taking care of businesses and many other people and you're affecting your, your communities that way, but be a partaker in the ministry of God here while you have time so that you actually will have a massive bank account in heaven where you're gonna spend all of eternity. All of eternity. God's truths are simple, but they're also real. And if we are just consumed with this world and we fall in love with this world and take everything we can from this world, we will get to the end of it and realize that it's not going with us. And we will live our last days with regret. I spent too much time with dying people that their end is inevitable and they regret. I should have spent more time with my wife. I should have done more with the message of God. I should have loved my children better. And it's just too late. You'll never find one of those guys that says, man, I should have just really expanded my company to China. I really should have bought those new rims for my truck. Ah, what was I thinking? I should have went with the 12 inch subs, not the 10 inch ones. No, don't let death or the, the revelation that it is coming be that which wakens you up because that is a place that hell is associated with. Do you realize the purest definition of hell where it says it is a place of constant gnashing of teeth? It's not dogs biting at you, but it's this place of oh, constant regret. Constant regret of not seizing the day. It's that moment when you knew your flight was at 5.45, but you just couldn't get out the door fast enough and you're pulling up the airport and it's gone, it's just too late. And you're like, oh, if I would've just brushed my teeth faster, if I would've set my alarm earlier and I hit snooze. And, and you start going through all the things and then the rest of the day, you're just like, I wish I would've, could've, should've, would've, I should've done that if I would've only done this different. That's what hell is. Hell is all of a sudden the revelation of what this whole world was about and you seeing all of the opportunities that you missed for eternity. You live in that regret. Live your life with no regrets. It is so worth it to live life on purpose, not on accident. Today. Today. You can seize the moment, right? Carpe diem. And say yes to what God is stirring in your hearts. Whether it be salvation or ministry that's in your heart, that you've been sitting in a paralyzing state saying, I need a thousand things to be able to do this ministry. God's saying to you, no. Five loaves, two fish, what do you have? Do you have a yes? Are you willing to say, there's no way to pass from this side of the river to the next, but actually put your foot in and let them part the seas? Do you have that kind of faith? that anything that is good that is placed inside of you is from and of God. And if it's going to be real ministry, it has to be bigger than what you can do. Because otherwise it requires no faith. And apart from faith, you're just throwing money at a wall and creating a concert. And you're like, wow, 5,000, give me $50,000, I can get 10,000 people to show up. That's not ministry. The ministry is the Holy Spirit's there. And life is given. And prayer went into it. And lives were changed. It's not about a good message, thank you, Joe, you preached a good word and you forgot about it by the time you got out the parking lot. It's a good message if God puts something in your heart that has to grow. So anyways, I'm gonna end there and just say, guys, life is too short. I've read the end of the book, it doesn't get better and it doesn't get easier. All it does is it continues to refine. It seeks after the remnants of those that are actually pure and just continues to refine it. And whether it's five in this room or 50,000, for those that truly have the Holy Spirit, there is no work that is not accomplishable. Not accom I mean, we're talking about uncredentialed fishermen, rougher looking than me, that are the birth of billions of saved people. If they can do it, what, what can you do? Good looking, 
smooth talking, living in a country where everything and anything is possible. That is not a truth for everybody in the world. To be born to such a country as this, that you could have a 13-year-old mom, live your entire life in foster care, in and out of juvie, and still become the president, or still become a doctor, or still become an amazing dad, or fill in the blank. That's not a reality for all of the world. The reality for some of the world is their hopes and dreams stop at a certain level. They may be able to have peace and patience, kindness, hope, all those price, you know, priceless commodities, but you live in a place where you do anything you want. I say let's start leveraging the we can do whatever we want for the benefit of more people than just ourselves. And let's bring whatever pieces of heaven we can to this earth in a time such as this, where kids today need role models. The youth of your church should be able to look up and say, man, I wanna be like that guy. I see him serving in jail ministry. I wanna be like that guy. I see him starting a Bible study. I wanna be like that guy that just seems to always wanna greet everybody at the door and wish him a good morning. I wanna be like that guy that sees somebody hurting in the audience. He just goes to them and starts praying. I wanna, I wanna be like that girl over there that just seems to like, although she's beautiful and should be so unapproachable, she still wants to say hi to everybody and she lifts my spirits. We need kids today to not just see, oh, laws, do's, don'ts, God's such a bummer, dude. He doesn't let me have any fun. Mom and dad are always telling No, we need kids today that see the motive behind it. That say, no. Mom and dad and Jesus are just telling me to do this and not do this because it's what's best for me and what's best for others. And get back to the motive and the purity of the righteous one who had the authority to establish these things that says you no longer need to obey it through fear but now obey it through grace and do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. God bless all of you guys. Visit us at the booth. Josh, I don't know if you have any final words. Thanks for letting me preach 30 minutes over. Yes. (laughs) You're awesome.